The winds of change continue to sweep through the Big East as the league readies to carry on without two of its core members. And the transformation continues with the news that Rutgers and Louisville and seven of the Big East non-FBS institutions announced their departures as well. But despite the massive changes, we tip off this season knowing the Big East stands as one of the nation's premier basketball conferences stocked with some of the most talented coaches and players in America with their eyes set on Atlanta. And we break down the road ahead on the City Big East Season Preview Show beginning now. Great to have you with us. We welcome you inside our New York studios for the Big East Conference Season Preview Show. Gary Apple sitting alongside the former St. John standout, Tariq Turner, Lenny Robbins from the post, and thrilled to have Scoop Jardine, the former Syracuse point guard, joining us here in the studio tonight. Want to wish Happy New Year to all of you, fellas. And I think the last time we saw you, Scoop, you were you're a little bit emotional after that loss to Ohio State in the Elite Eight. But what have you been up to? I've just been rehabbing. You know, I just. Uh... I broke my foot two days before the draft, so I'm, I'm basically just rehabbing, trying to get back, working on plan B until plan A clear up for me. What about the conference? Couple of games in the books, fellas. Uh, we saw Connecticut go down in overtime. We saw Cincinnati beat Pittsburgh. Is, is it what you expected the conference to be so far? We got out the gate strong. You know, Cincinnati beat Pitt, and then Marquette with a thrilling uh, overtime win last night versus UConn, and the excitement is, is really where you want it to be, getting out the gates, big time Big East basketball, competitive down to the wire. The overtime game last night, UConn losing was a phenomenal game. Well, listen, let's give a lot of credit to uh, the way Marquette played. And Buzz Williams, he's had his issues already this year, Lenny, but they just play and they show up to play every single night. They really do, and that's the one thing I love about this Marquette team, and the reason I think you cannot count them out, because they will play hard on a consistent basis, probably better than any team in the conference. I know how much you like Mick Cronin at Cincinnati and the job he has done, and that's a good win for them out of the gate against Pittsburgh. No question. It's definitely a big win, and Cincinnati wins uh, not the flashy way, but they're scrappy, they're tough, and they have great guard play with Cashmere Wright and Kilpatrick, one of the top Big East uh, backcourts. I really like the way Cashmere Wright controlled the tempo, 18 points, and you know what Kilpatrick brings, a strong scoring guard at 6'4", shoots the ball inside and out. Cincinnati ranked 14th in America. They are one of six Big East teams ranked in the top 25 uh. right now, and it's a busy night to really kick things off. This is the first full night of action in the Big East. Five games. Uh, Providence going to take on Louisville. That game to be seen right here on SNY. Rutgers and Syracuse. Jim Beheim going for 9-0-3. St. John's Villanova down along the main line. South Florida goes out of conference but in state. And Seton Hall going to take on DePaul. That's our 9 o'clock game here on SNY tonight. So let's talk about the teams atop the conference as things get going. And I think it's only apropos, Scoop. I begin with you and, and what you think of Syracuse this year. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be biased here, you know. Me playing at Syracuse, I got to be real biased. At least he admits it. <laughs> yeah. I, I really believe we could be a really good team, you know, if Brandon Trish come to play every night and be that senior leader that we need, that I was last year for our team. And I think we have a, a lot of great young guys like Michael Carter-Williams who's been playing phenomenal basketball. So, you know, I got to be biased. You know, the Cuse, I'm a big fan. It's, it's my auto mater, and I, that's what I'm really And you should be biased. I mean, oh, it's, sure. it's, it's in your blood. But what, sure. what about Louisville now? They're coming off a trip to the Final Four. They come off a win against Kentucky uh, last time out. Well, I, I think they're the best team in the Big East, and the reason is because <laughs> they separate themselves with other teams with their defense. They're relentless on the defensive end. They lead the Big East in steals. They play that up-tempo, frenetic style, but it works for them based on their personnel. Very deep at the guard slot. Gorgie Jang back from the broken wrist gives you the anchor down low, and they're clicking on all cylinders with Russ Smith leading the way. And let's talk more about Cincinnati and McCronin's team. 13-1. and one. Again, they won their, their uh, conference opener, Len. Yeah, and really, they should be 14-0. You know, look, I agree with Tariq said. With that backcourt of SK47 and Kashmir Wright, they are terrific. <laughs> but to me, the play that separates them is Jaquan Parker because he's a 6'3", 6'4", 2'3", guy. He can hit it from the outside. He goes to the basket. He rebounds. He is a mismatch nightmare. 
Let's get a look at the teams in the top 25. As I mentioned, there are six of them from the Big East in the top 25 at the moment, and it's led by Rick Pitino and Louisville. They've got just the one loss that was to Duke, and there's Syracuse at seven, Cincinnati at 14, Georgetown, John Thompson the third at 15, Notre Dame, and what a job Mike Bray is doing again. I mean, no shocker there. They're at 21, and Pittsburgh at 24 so far on the season. What about Pittsburgh, Scoop? I know you like them a lot. Yeah, I really do. I think Pittsburgh is one of those teams that's going to be really good down the stretch. I, uh, they, they they low on talent right now, but I think Jamie Dixon do a great job of really getting the best out of his team. They got a, a good four-year uh, senior in uh, Trayvon Woodall, who I think is a really good player who's going to lead this team to where they need to be, and they've been playing really uh, great basketball. They have been. They've got the point guard, and they've got the, they've got the young freshman in the middle. And Adams, what about your alma mater? Are they a sleeper, St. John's? I, I say they are a sleeper because they have a lot of young, uh, untapped talent that really hasn't fulfilled its potential. Jakar Sampson, probably the best Big East rookie this season, along with Obekpa, the best shot blocker in the country, in my opinion, and some young sophomore talent in D'Angelo Harrison, the second leading scorer in the Big East. They haven't maximized their potential, but they have a lot of pieces there. Coach Lavin has to find out a way to put it all together in one rotation. Notre Dame 12 and 1. They also beat Kentucky. They're very tough to beat in their building, Len. Well, it's not just that they beat them. They dismantled them. Yes. They dismantled them because I don't think any team in the Big East at this point in the season plays better team basketball offensively than Notre Dame. You see the shots that they get. They go to the basket. They look for each other. They make the other pass. The backcourt now has been together for a full year and with Cooley down low, you've got a monster of a play. I think this is a very balanced, tough team. Georgetown, by the way, has held 8 of 11 opponents under 60 points so far this season. 60 or, or under. I mean, they, they beat you on the defensive end as much as anything. They really do, and they're so disciplined offensively. They don't they don't wow you with with flash, but they run that run that Princeton offense, anchored by Otto Porter, who's one of the best players in the Big East, one of my favorite players at the three spot. And along with the development of Markel Starks, I think they have a really good component of backcourt guys that can get you to the postseason. And how about coaches that are doing a great job early on? Let, let's talk about the guy who's coaching at Georgetown. That's John Thompson, the third. He brings those Princeton principles with him, and he does it very well. Well, I'm stuck between two point guards, but I'm going to follow Tariq again, okay? <laughs> what JT3 has done, I think, is really exceptional. Think about this. He loses Hollis Thompson, Jason Clark, who is one of those guys who just knew how to win, and Henry Sims, who was as good as any big man in the NCAA tournament last year. And he has this team playing terrific basketball. What he does is he maximizes each player. And with Otto Porter Jr., who I said before the season was going to be the player of the year, Tariq was the only one who didn't laugh in my face. I want to thank you for that nationally, yeah, okay? <laughs> Greg Whittington and Jabril Trawick, they have mismatch guys, three different mismatch guys who can do a lot of different things. Very difficult team to prepare for. Mick Cronin, seventh year at Cincinnati. You know, it's hard to believe, but he really, there were uh, rumors and rumblings that he might be on the hot seat a few years ago, yeah. took his team into the tournament to the Sweet 16 a year ago. I have a lot of respect for this coach, mainly because he's winning without star players. He won 26 games the last two seasons, went to the Sweet 16 last year, and he, he wins by scrappy defensive play. He had Yancey Gates down low last year as his anchor, but now he has a guard-oriented team with Starks, I'm sorry, with, with Kashmir Wright, Kilpatrick, and Jaquan Parker, who plays multiple positions. I like the way they play the basketball. They expect to win, and they're primed for the postseason. And is there anybody anybody more intense? I mean, Scoop, you've been on the court yeah. uh, playing against Jamie Dixon at Pittsburgh. I mean, he gets into the game. Jamie Dixon is one of those coaches going to get the best out of all his players. Like I, He's my pick, you know, because I really believe he had a down year last year, and this year is I know he's more motivated to get this team back. They got a great young core group of guys. And they also got their leader and their point guard. And that's what you want to have on any team. You want to have your point guard. And he's the leader. And he's the senior. And he know what it takes to really win. So I think Jamie Dixon is going to do a great job here at, at Pitt. And I really believe that uh, Pitt is going to do good this well, year. Well, certainly at Big East has been a coach's league from the very beginning. Jim Beheim, he's picked up his 900th career victory. Looking for number 903 tonight. Look at a pass. Bob Knight, Kevin Ollie getting the extension at Connecticut, and then Mike Rice returning after that three-game suspension. Uh, Lenny, what about Kevin Ollie finally getting the extension at Connecticut? Well, he earned it. I mean, that's the bottom line. He earned it by the way, not just that they played, but the way he recruited and the way he conducted himself. Look, Jim Calhoun was a great coach. He's a Hall of Fame coach, but sometimes he became the show. And I think what Ward Manuel said was, we like this guy as a coach and as a person and as the face of our program going forward. Let's get to break here on our conference preview show. When we come back, I want to hear from Steve Lavin, the head coach 
of St. John's. He's one of the coaches of the seven Catholic schools who are breaking away from the Big East. We'll get his thoughts on the winds of change when we come back from New York City in just a moment. Well, I think the seven school presidents decided that Uh, yeah. Everybody's doing a fine. Okay. <clears throat> yes, for sure. Thirty seconds. Right. Okay. No conference in America undergoing the number of changes the Big East is. Certainly we know that Pittsburgh and Syracuse and Louisville, Rutgers, Notre Dame, they're all on their way out. And the recent announcement that the seven non-FBS schools are banding together and also leaving the Big East, the Catholic Seven as they're known. Here's the head coach of St. John, Steve Lavin, on the decision to break away from the Big East. Well, I think the seven school presidents decided that they wanted to shape the future uh, of the conference and they're looking out for the best interests and as a result uh, they've come together and they're moving in a new direction and uh, I think it was the right choice. Uh, you can't fault uh, the presidents for wanting to be able to shape and control their future and to position these schools uh, in the best possible way to be competitive moving forward. We welcome you back inside our New York studios. Gary Apple, Tariq Turner, Glenn Robbins, and Scoop Jardine with us. And I'll begin with you on that, Lenny. You heard what Steve had to say. Did they have a choice? I, you know, I don't think they did. And let me just start by saying what a shame this is that the Big East has come to this. I yep. mean, for those of us who grew up with this league, who saw it in 1979 explode to become the first and only conference to put three teams in a Final Four, for it to have fallen apart like this really is disheartening. But, no, they didn't have a chance. It was a mixed marriage, and it was a mixed marriage where – Neither side agreed with what the other wanted. One wanted to play big time college football and get that money. One wanted to keep the rivalries. And it just got to the point where the Catholic Seven said, enough's enough. We have to go back to what we were. All right, so Scoop and, and Tariq, you both played in this conference. I'll begin with you on this, Scoop. Is, is it heartbreaking for you, a kid from Philadelphia who played all those years at Syracuse? Most definitely. Uh, big East was one of the reasons I, you know, is I wanted to go to Syracuse. Like they, them playing in the Big East was definitely playing at the Garden, and I think uh, I'm, I'm heartbreak, I'm heartbroken because I feel like, you know, it's it's not like playing in the Garden in the Big East tournament. And, A lot and, of kids don't get to get that and weren't, experience. And weren't, weren't you saying that you spoken with Carmelo Anthony? Oh yeah, also yeah, Melo. Like he said, he was trying to he's trying to get the ACC to. Bring, the, have it. bring the Can't tournament bring it. back to the bring, I think that's a great idea, though. I, I, really I believe can't so. go with you, Scoop. I love you, man. <laughs> you know, but we're, we're diehard Big East guys. You, you grew up playing in the Big East. Yes. I, I grew up watching Mark Jackson, Sherman Douglas, you know, Pearl Washington, and that's why I played in the Big East. And to, to be part of the Big East and, 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 and swallow the idea of them taking over, the ACC taking over the Big East uh, home court, the Garden, is just too hard for me to imagine. And, and also, there's still a possibility that these seven uh, basketball schools that branched out 
um, to form their own conference may still keep that Big East court, uh, that Madison Square Garden as their home court, which I would love to see being that St. John's is part of that seven. But it's a lot of moving parts, a lot of politics, a lot of football, TV talk. Personally, I would hate to see the ACC come to, be, uh, to the Garden. Yeah. That's just me. All right, so, so you don't like it. Scoop likes it. You play referee, Lenny. What do you think? Well, I, I think that the, the Garden – if they have their preference, and they do, are probably going to stick with the Catholic group of seven if they can reconstitute itself correctly. If they get the Dayton, Butler, Xavier, St. Louis, and make it back to what they were, that inner city, urban kind of market, that is what's most appealing to the Garden. There have been some very preliminary discussions with the ACC about a year ago. I still think that they're plan B or maybe even plan C. So we don't know what the future is going to hold there, but what we do know is that the locals, all three of them, are off to a pretty good start. Seton Hall 11-2 going to take on DePaul here on SNY tonight. Rutgers at the Cuse and then Villanova and St. John's getting together. I want to begin with, with the Hall and, and the job that Kevin Willard has done. Well, I think Kevin Willard is one of the bright young coaches in this Big East Conference and, and I think the reason he's played well is because he has good guard play. Fuquan Edwin, who's now a junior, uh, is stepping up in the scoring lead. Now that they lost Theodore Pope and, and, um, and Theodore, uh, Jordan Theodore and Pope, Fuquan has to step up and be that scoring guy. They're leading the Big East in three-point shots made at about eight a game. That's a big part of their offense. They're off to a good start. Lenny, what about St. John, Steve Lavin? He's got a very young team, and they've been very up and down so far this season. Well, you know, he, he's had to order pacifiers, right, because they are that young, <laughs> all freshmen and sophomores, okay? But having said that, they're immensely talented, immensely athletic. Um, they're very weak inside. They're hoping to get Orlando, Orlando Sanchez um, eligible. They should be hearing from the NCAA in about seven to ten days, as I've reported. Um, this team is going to be mercurial. They're going to have some nights where they look like they can beat anyone, and they're going to have yeah. some nights when they look like they can lose to anyone. They're going to be a really fun team to cover. And as I mentioned a moment ago, Syracuse, Jim Beheim going for their 903rd win for Jim tonight, going to take on Rutgers. Mike Rice going to be back on the sideline after a three-game suspension. They come in at 9-2. and two. When we come back, well, it's, I think it's only apropos for Scoop to comment on his coach, Jim Beheim. when we come back in just a moment. I remember the first few years, 10 years in the league, just thinking, I, I I remember the first few years, 10 years in the league, just thinking, I, I you know, I, I can't make it. This, this is too tough. This, you know, I can't go more than a couple more years. And, uh, you know, to still be here um, after all those years is, to me, is hard to believe. To win, you know, this game was, it was more pressure than I've uh, felt in a long time. Coach a long time, you're going to win a lot of games. It's as simple as that. If you're in a good place, and I'm in a good place, one of the coaching legends, Jim Beheim, closing in now on 903 victories. Chance to pick it up tonight to move past Bobby Knight to number two on the all-time wins list. Let's hear from Jim and from Jamie Dixon on their squads and leaving the Big East. 
with every team, you have to focus on this season. You can't look back and you can't, you know, look forward. You have to focus everything on this team. That's what you expect your players to do. That's what you have to do as a coach. And, you know, when you get old, you know, although I am old now, but when you get old, real old, older, older then I'll look back and see what uh, all, all the great years. When we came 14 years ago, we didn't have a facility. We didn't have any tradition. We didn't have great players. What we sold was being a member of the Big East Conference. That was what we sold, playing the best conference in the country, be on TV. And so it's it's tough. I mean, that's it's made us. It's made us our basketball program, which has helped make our university what it is. And so it's uh, it's meant a lot to us. There's no question about it. As I mentioned earlier, the Big East has always been a conference of great coaches, and they're losing a couple of them in Jim Beheim and Jamie Dixon, Mike Bray, Rick Pacino as well. But, Scoop, you're the only one up here who's been in the huddle and gotten the, the tongue lashings that Jim Beheim often <laughs> uh, uh, directs at his players. But what was it like to play for him? It was an honor. You know, I think when I first went to Syracuse playing for a Hall of Fame coach and Coach Beheim was great. You know, I got to learn a lot from him on the court and off the court, and I think – it's, tr it's a tremendous job that he did at Syracuse for so many years, you know, and that's his alma mater. That's, that's the school he went to, and I think he gave everything to Syracuse. So for Coach Beheim to get his 900 win is, is great. You know, I know he don't really – he downplayed it he a does. lot. He always down, but he know he's one of the most competitive coaches I've ever seen. And getting 900 wins in the past, you know, tonight will be, it's going to be great for him, and I'm happy to see it, and I'm also happy to be a part of a lot of a big, a big part of it. Letty, you've known him for so many years. Yeah, I have, unfortunately. But I'll tell you what. The thing that is most impressive to me about Jim Beheim, and the most important thing in life to me is, do you know who you are? Jim Beheim knows exactly who he is. He's a guy from upstate New York. Yep. He didn't want to come to New York City. He doesn't like the traffic. He doesn't like the crowds. And I remember walking through the bowels of Madison Square Garden two years ago before a Big East tournament game, and he had a red book out, one of those old red books that we used to like write down our right. schedule in, and he still used that. And I said, uh, have you heard of a smartphone or anything like that? And he was <laughs> like, I've always used this, and it always works. He knows who he is, and that's why I respect so much what he's done. Well, I was going to, I was going to email him. And he is him. old. I, well, he's <laughs> getting up there. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was going to email him last year, and I was told, don't, don't email because he doesn't right. use email. <laughs> but what I mentioned a moment ago, that the iconic coaches – who are all leaving the Big East. Well, it's the sad part of, of this transition of the Big East no longer being what we know. And this legacy of Hall of Fame coaches, when you talk about Patino and, 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 and Beheim and possibly even Jamie Dixon at some point with the wins he's had, uh, it's really a, a sad moment along with Mike Bray, who's very under, underrated because of these other great coaches. Uh, it's definitely uh, an influx of, or an outflux of coaches that are leaving the Big East that have made it such a special conference. Coaching and personalities and wins wins are what defines the Big East. And it goes back to the very beginning. It goes back to, to you know, Luke Harnasek, and it go, goes back to John Thompson and, and Raleigh Massimino. It, it really does. And we have to remember why the Big East worked. The Big East was founded in 1979. ESPN's founded in 1979. Right. It was a perfect marriage, right? The Big East gave that network great, great stuff to run. And the network gave the Big East great exposure. And that's why Jamie Dixon said it great. It made us. Kids look on TV. Yeah. How many guys from California does Syracuse get? Right. It's unbelievable. For years. Right? Stevie yeah. Thompson yeah. came, you know, Ron Ellis yeah. came, and yeah. it changed. And there's no the question when you look at the basketball history and, and dominance uh, of college basketball, the Big East stands out at least for the last 10 to 15 years as a preeminent uh, basketball powerhouse conference. And it's amazing. All the coaches we named there, I, I didn't mention Jim Calhoun. The guy's only won three national championships. So, so what a legacy the Big East has left. And when we come back here on our preview broadcast, go to take a look at the best players in the conference. We're back with that. Wrap it up in just a moment.
Top scorers in the Big East so far as they really kick into conference play. Bryce Cotton, somebody we have not spoken about at Providence, leads the conference at 22 a game, followed by D'Angelo Harrison and Russ Smith. So those are the numbers as they stack up right now. What about the guys that have impressed you the most? And I'll begin with you, Tariq. I got to go with Russ Smith. At this point in the season, after watching what he did versus Kentucky, 17 points in the second half, along with seven rebounds and three steals, he just has a unique game because he has a great motor, unconventional game. He doesn't take a lot of great shots, but he finds a way to be effective. One of the Big East steals leaders, third in the conference in scoring. And I think with him and Steven in the backcourt, they make a potent backcourt for the Big East. Lenny, I turn to you. Who's impressed you so far? Otto Porter Jr. I thought he was going to be the preseason player of the year before the season. He's been better than I thought. You know, 13 points on 51% shooting, 7.7 rebounds, second on the team in assists, 22 steals, 14 blocks, and sources tell the post he helped negotiate the fiscal cliff. <laughs> he can do That's everything. good work. What about you, Scoop? Who's Once your again, guy? I'm going to be biased. Be biased. Carter Williams. I feel like as a point guard, Michael Carter Williams has been doing everything. You know, he's 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 averaging a double double. You know, he's first in in steals in the, in a in a conference and and just everything. He he's the motor of the team. He gets the team going on both ends. And he also is rebounding the ball. And not only that, he he's scratching his head on a couple triple doubles. And that's great as a as a point guard. And he is uh, he's a big guy. I mean, you're, you're oh, about six, six, about six, I'm six No, I'm six three. He's six six legit. Legitimately. Legit. Yeah. And and, and I think. I think he's doing a great job. And he can see that. over defenses, which is uh, all important for the point guard. So that's going to wrap up our conference <laughs> preview show. For Tariq Turner and for Lenny Robbins and for Scoop Jardine, I'm Gary Apple. We thank you for joining us. Joining us, and we say so long from New York City.